Well, let's prepare our hearts and mind to go into the Word this morning. And as we go into the Word, I want to inform you that we are at the end of our serious, uh, series on trust in God. We started off by saying week one at the first of the year that we must trust God. And then we spent some time talking about trust resulting in obedience as we focused in on this passage in Genesis chapter 22, specifically the story of Abraham and Isaac. So today, we're going to review a little bit from last week, then we're going to dive into the lesson to allow God to speak and have his way this morning. So bow your heads with me for a word of prayer, and then we're going to go to God's word and allow God to speak to us this morning. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for what you're doing. You are an awesome, you are a wonderful, you are a superb, you are just a phenomenal God, Lord. So as we go to scripture this morning to learn what it means to trust you, um, specifically a trust that results in obedience, continue to grow us deeper, God, continue to teach us, continue to show us what you need us to learn from your word so we can be more like you and be the church that you are calling us to be. So Felix removes himself, God. I say this every single week. And Holy Spirit, speak through me to your people. It's about you and it's not about us. So bless and have your way. It is in your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. So listen, grab your Bibles, and I'm going to say this often, make sure it's a word. Um, I know you have your electronic devices and all that fancy stuff, but if we can get used to God's word, if you have it close by, go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 22, and today we are going to look at trust resulting in obedience as we dive deeper into the end of this narrative in front of us. But before I go there, let me review where we ended last week, and then we're going to pick up and dig deeper into the text to hear what God is saying to us. So last week, when we looked at the passage, we spent some time talking, first of all, number one, that our obedience is an indicator of our level of trust in God. And as we looked at that, we saw specifically verses 3 and 5 of Genesis chapter 22, and we saw that God had called Abraham to offer Isaac on the altar of sacrifice, and the thing with Abraham is he had such a high level of trust in God that he immediately obeyed God. Now, what was paramount about what we shared last week is that Abraham's faith that we saw in Genesis chapter 22 was not the faith that Abraham began with in Genesis chapter 17. And the reason that is important is because you and I, it's easy for us to look at Abraham's faith at this mountainous position where he is obeying God and he's offering his son as a sacrifice. And it's easy for us to say, we're not there. And I don't disagree with you. But I wanted you to see last week the trajectory and the journey that Abraham was on to get to the place where he obeyed God. It started out with disobedience. It started out in Genesis chapter 17 with laughter. It started out with, with him doubting God, him, both him and his wife, Sarah. But then God did some things in their life to grow them to where they are in Christ right now. And I might say something about that a little later in the message. Now, the, the reason I, I, I'm hanging out on point one by way of review is I want you to see the three lessons that Abraham learned to get him from no trust to high trust, right? Or from no faith or little faith to much faith. Here's the first lesson that Abraham learned. Abraham learned, number one, that he could trust God's word. Now, I need to spend a moment there because God had released a prophetic word over Abraham's life. He re released a word of blessing saying he would make his name great and he would multiply his seed. And what Abraham learned that when God says something, it is as good as done. Now, he did not know that going in, but on the journey, the moment Isaac was born, he realized that God is good for his word. Now, may I say this to you and to myself as we're listening this morning? We, we must learn to trust God at his word. We must learn 
to trust God at his word. Here's the second thing that Abraham learned or the lesson he learned about God, right? He learned that with God, nothing was impossible. Let me make it present tense. Nothing is impossible with God. If God could take a 99-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman and reopen their wombs and cause them to reproduce, there is nothing that God can't do. So as Abraham was on his journey of trusting God, of growing to trust God resulting in obedience, he had these two lessons thus far in his, in his mind. I can trust God at his word, and I understand that nothing is impossible with God. So if God is calling me to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, if I obey God, God has the ability to raise him up. God has the ability to give me another Isaac. God has the ability to do whatever God chooses to do. And I want us to learn as we talk about trusting God this, this morning that nothing is impossible with God. And then here's the third lesson that Abraham learned, right? He learned that any act of obedience is an act of worship to God. Now, I can't emphasize that enough as we learn about trusting God. When we obey God, it is an act of worship to God. Here is what Abraham said to his servants, right? Stay here with the mule. And then he says, I and the boy are going to go over there. Listen to this and worship God, then we will return, right? So it seems to me, if we can get our obedience right, that it's an act of worship. And it seems to me that if we can worship God the way God desires to be worshiped, we will be amazed at what God does in his life. So the first thing, lock into the first thing, it was that obedience is an indicator of our level of trust. Here was the second thing that we talked about last week and where I left the sermon off, and I'm really going to pick up here to go deeper into those sets of verses. Trust resulting in obedience. This is number two. Here's what it means. No wiggle room, right? Let me read Genesis 22, 6, and I'm going to give you a little bit of last week. And if you missed that, make sure you go back and listen to that sermon. It's on our YouTube channel, on the RCF network. Go grab that, listen to it to bring you up to speed. Here's what Genesis 22 and 6 says, right? Uh, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, right? And so they both, so went, they went, both of them together. Okay, now he took the wood, he laid it on his son Isaac, he took the knife and the fire in his own two hands, and they set off to offer this sacrifice to the Lord. Now, if you listen to the message last week, I said there's no wiggle room if we really trust God and our trust results in obedience. We eliminate all wiggle room. I mentioned my mentor by the name of Elder Johnny Barnes who would always say to me in all of my decision making, Pastor, no wiggle room. In everything that I do, he would say to me, Pastor, no wiggle room. And what Elder Barnes was really saying to me is, Pastor Felix, Eliminate those places where you can live as if God doesn't do what God said he's going to do. You've got it figured out, right? So he, what he was really saying to me is when you make a decision to trust that results in obedience, trust God such that you're going to obey him, get rid of any escape route. Get rid of anything that doesn't look like complete obedience. In other words, he was saying to me, like we would say to the guys on the basketball court, right? Go hard or go home, right? Go all in or don't even do it at all. So when we say trust resulting in obedience means no wiggle room, here's what Abraham did. He literally took the wood and placed it on his son. He could have said to his servants, stay here with the mule and then keep the wood and keep the knife and keep the fire, and might I add, and keep the rope because we won't need these things because I know God's going to come through for me. Had he done that, that would have been wiggle room. But I want you to hear me say, Abraham had every intention to literally and physically offer Isaac as a sacrifice. He eliminated 
any possibility of a wiggle room that would give him an out. He was completely sold out to God. So he had the wood on the boy and he had the rope. I'm adding that. Then he had the knife. He carried that himself. And he carried the fire in his hand. And together they set off. In Abraham's mind, Isaac was as good as dead. And whatever God did with that, that was God's business, right? And that's a great segue into where I want to pick up this morning. But before I say that, check yourself for wiggle room. Check your decision processes for wiggle room. Check to make sure that when God calls you and when God says, I need you to go do this or offer this sacrifice, that our obedience to God does not include any space where we can weasel our way out or wiggle our way out if God doesn't do what we anticipate and or expect that he should do, right? Now, here's the third point. Here's, here's the thing where I want to begin this morning, and here's where we're going to dive deeper into the text. Listen to this. Obedience then, obedience to God, trust resulting in obedience. Listen to this. It obligates God to his word. Now, I know you've heard that before. I'm going to clean it up, and I'm going to talk about this um, because I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Let me say it again. Trust resulting in obedience obligates God to his word. In other words, if God said it, you can trust him. I want you all to hear me say that. If God said it, you can trust him. Let us read. Let us read. Look at, look at verse 7 of Genesis chapter 22. Let me read verse 7 and verse 8. Here's what it says. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. And he said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the bird offering? Verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And so they went, both of them, together. Now, you can't blame Isaac for the question. I can't blame Isaac for the question. Matter of fact, the two lads that were left behind probably were wondering the same thing, but none of them were bold enough to ask the question, right? So you've got to see this scene. All of a sudden, they, they, when they left Beersheba where they was, and when they left home for the land of Moriah, you've got to understand they were assuming along the way before they got to where they were going to go, the full expectation from this crew that was traveling with Abraham is that somewhere along the way, they would pick up a lamb, they would get a ram, they would get something that would be offered as a sacrifice. They traveled for three days. Abraham picks nothing up. Then all of a sudden, they get to the base of where God is calling them to go. And Abraham says to the two lads, you stay here. And then he takes the wood and he puts the wood on Isaac, and he no doubt the rope, and they can probably justify the rope because they were saying that's probably going to be used to bind a sacrifice. Abraham takes the knife in his hand, and he takes the fire, and he says to his son, hey boy, let's go. We're almost there. We're almost on the scene, and you cannot blame Isaac for looking at his daddy and say, daddy, aren't we missing something? We're going to worship God with a sacrifice, and as if he's saying to him, I see the fire, I see the wood, I see the knife, but I don't see a sacrifice, right? I don't see a sacrifice. Now, now, might I add this before I dig deeper into the text, um, that the reason most of us trust or struggle with trust resulting in obedience is because like Isaac, God calls us to do something, and the first thing we look for is where is the sacrifice, right? 
And, 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 and the reason we don't obey is because we don't see the sacrifice. And listen to this, and I want you to hear me say, sometimes God is calling you, sometimes he's calling me to be the sacrifice. And because we're not willing to be the sacrifice that God has called us to be, we are looking externally. We are looking outside of us. And I've been trying to hint at this all along. I'm going to be more blatant. And, and God is calling calling you, he's calling me to be the sacrifices that he wants to do what he wants done. And a lot of times we are not obedient because we are looking externally. We're looking outside of us and we miss hearing what God wants done. It's very, very important for you to hear me say, God wants out of you what he birthed in you. He does not want what we create in the flesh. I'm hoping you can understand what I'm saying because it's easy for me. You, you, I, let, let me go here and I'll say it again. With Abraham, he created this Ishmael and he wanted to give Ishmael to God, but God did not want what Abraham created. God God wanted what he created in Abraham. He wanted the impossible. So God doesn't want what you can bring to him naturally. Let me say it this way. He don't want us to offer him anything that doesn't cost us anything. That's not trust. Trust means that I give God what he's calling from for me. So here's this boy. Daddy, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Now, here's where I'm going to get into the point that I just made. Trust resulting in obedience obligates God to his word. That's what I just said to you. Abraham's response is striking because his response is not a evasion of what was about to happen. His response was pretty much an obligation on what he knew God could do. Remember the lessons that I shared with you. He can trust God at his word. He knew with God nothing was impossible. And he knew any act of obedience was an act of worship. So with that information, listen to how Abraham's response, right? God will provide for himself, okay? Some of your translations may say God himself will provide. Now, you need this backdrop to appreciate what we're really talking about this morning. In the Levitical sacrificial systems, right, or in the cultic worship systems of the Levites or the Old Testament patriarchs, here is what it would look like. If I was going to worship God as the one going to worship, I would be the one responsible for finding the sacrifice and finding what I'm going to offer, and the offerer would be the one placing it on the altar, right? So, so, so I want y'all to hear me say, so, so if I am initiating the worship experience, if I am initiating the offering experience, oh my goodness, this is good, I am responsible for bringing the offering to God. Now, what's unique about the level of trust that I'm talking about this morning, Abraham was not initiating anything. God was calling Abraham to offer the sacrifice. So listen to this. God was the initiator of this worship experience. This is paramount and this is critical. And Abraham knew because God initiated the obligation was on God to provide the sacrifice. Oh, I wish I had somebody this morning that was about to be offered on that altar. In other words, what Abraham really said to Isaac when Isaac said to him, hey, dad, I see the wood and I see the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Here is Abraham's um, response. God is obligated to his own word. So if God asks me to bring a sacrifice, it's apparent to me that God has a sacrifice, right? Now, granted, 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 everything Abraham knew 
Isaac was the sacrifice that God wanted, but he wasn't going to tell his son that that wasn't his place to do that, but he knew God was obligated to his word, and if the word over Isaac's life was that's going to be the vehicle through which God was going to bless him, Abraham knew that God was going to do something phenomenal and something miraculous in his presence. Now, the reason I want to flesh that out is because some of us have heard this concept obligate God to his word, right? And we have mistakenly heard that doctrine and we have misapplied it. We have um, uh, brought it into our lives. And here's what we do. We conjure up desires. And then we add to our prayers, God, I'm obligating to your word. So in other words, God, I need a car. And your word says you own the cattle on a thousand hills and all things are possible. And, and, and we mistakenly take our, listen to this, fleshly desires. You'll appreciate this. Our Ishmael's, right? And we want to obligate God to his word because we said we want this. Hear me carefully. If I am initiating the request, I am never positioned to obligate God to do anything. But listen to this. When God is initiating the request, God is obligated to fulfill whatever he says. Why? Because he is God. You can appreciate this. In Genesis chapter 17, when God said, I'm going to open your wife's womb, here's what um, Abraham's response was. Hold up, God. You ain't got to do all that. Me and Sarah done took care of it. Excuse the grammar. Sarah and I have already taken care of it. So listen to this. I want you, God, to take Ishmael, right? Here's what God says. I didn't ask you for Ishmael. Lord, have mercy. Yeah, you and Sarah created Ishmael, not me. So here it is. I am not obligated to your requests. My goodness, you've got to hear this. But I am obligated to my dictates. That's a whole different framework. So what what Abraham was saying to his son that no doubt gave his son the comfort he needed, hey boy, God is calling me to sacrifice. And because God initiates, God will provide. Listen to me, church. Before you go trusting God for anything, before you go saying, God, I'm obligating to your word, make good and sure that God is initiating and not you, right? This is where our trusts fail. This is where we mess up because we have fleshly desires and we mistakenly believe our fleshly desires are God's plan. So hear me, before I go saying God is obligated to do, God is obligated to to deliver, before I say God will provide for himself, I need to make sure that God is the initiator of the requests, not me. All right? Lock that into your spirit. So we can't obligate God to our fleshly desires. We can only obligate God to what he initiated. You, let, let, me help you, let me help you with this. Let, so let me go to Calvary real quick, and then we're going to move on. Here's what Calvary looked like, right? God realized that man sinned. And you can see this in the text. So what does he do? He provides himself. He provided the sacrifice as an atonement for sin. He incarnated himself in the form of flesh, and he went, he lived that sinless life on earth, and God himself went to Calvary. You see how this works. When God sees a need, when God makes a request, he provides the way. So here's what that looks like. If God is calling you to sing a song, God will give you the song. If God is calling you to pray a prayer, God will give you the prayer. If God is calling you to start a ministry, God will give you the ministry. If God is calling you to give over and above, God will provide the money for you to give over and about. If God is calling you to start a business, God will give you the the business idea. Where we fail is when we come up with the stuff and we ask God to bless our stuff. So here's what my prayer should look like. God, what do you want? And I sit back and I let him speak. So like Abraham, my trust that results in obedience is based on the fact that God said and I respond. God said and I respond. Here's what this grows into, right? Point, the next point as we move on, point number four, right? 
trust resulting in obedience, here's what it does. It demonstrates a high level of reverence for God. And I won't stay here long. I won't stay here long because I want you all to hear me. Trust resulting in obedience, here's what it does. It demonstrates a high level of trust for God. Watch how the story develops. Look at verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him. Now, you got to let me, I got just got part. That had to be the most awkward walk that a father and his son ever had. God, where, hey, Daddy, where's the, I see the fire. I see the wood. I see the knife. Where's the sacrifice? And Daddy says, God's going to provide. Imagine what was going through Isaac's head, right? And verse 9 says, watch this. Then they come to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there. Got to learn how to build an altar. That's a whole other sermon. And he laid the wood in order. And then he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, there's probably a lot of narration that's missing here that Moses could have given, given us to help us understand what's really going on. I'm going to use my imagination to paint a picture for you, right? Then Abraham reached out. Look at verse 10, his hand. And he took the knife, listen, to slaughter his son, okay? Let, let me paint this picture. You got to lock into this. They get to the specific location. And Abraham says to Isaac, hey, Isaac, download the wood. And he takes the wood, and he goes off, and he's building the altar. I like the fact that the text says that when he reached the altar, um, he, 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 he laid the wood in order. He laid the wood in order. So you got to lock into what's happening. He probably whistling and lining them up and making sure it looks nice and it looks neat and it looks everything. And then the next text says, and he bound his son. So don't for one second think that Isaac just went and laid on top of the wood. No, 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 no. Abraham probably had to catch him. And you got to see that boy. Daddy, what are you doing? Daddy, hold up now. I thought I asked you where the sacrifice was. And you never said to me I would be the sacrifice. You've got to see some sort of a struggle for a little while. But the, te fact, the, te the text says Abraham was able to overpower Isaac, grabs him, wraps him up with the rope. And I can imagine... Isaac must have been screaming the whole time, Daddy, 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 what? Then he lays that boy on the altar, right? Then he grabs the knife, and he's about, he has his hand in the air. I want you to see obedience, right? About to kill his son. But as he raised his hand, look at verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he responded, here I am. Verse 12. And the angel said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. And watch this. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now we all know that child sacrifice was not something God was going to permit. We all know that child sacrifice was a pagan form of worship. Abraham did not know that at the time. He had no idea he was undergoing a test. Now, I need to point that out because sometimes when you and I, when God has called you and I to offer something, we have no idea in the moment that we're going through a test, right? Listen to what the angel of the Lord said to him. Don't lay a hand on the boy. And then here's what I want to talk about. For now I know that you fear me. How do I know that? Because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. That word fear used in the text there is the same word reverence, the same word that we can say faith in or trust in. Now I know, given the subject matter that we're talking about, Abraham, that I know that you trust me. Now, there's something critical in the text that you want, I want you to understand. Listen to this. Any true worshiper of God will hold nothing back from God if God is calling for the thing. Very, very important. So listen to the text. When the text says, 
now I know that you fear me. Hear this. God was not making a declarative statement to Abraham saying to him, hey, Abraham, I didn't know that about you, but after what I saw you did, now I know. So I am learning, Abraham. Hear me. The text is not saying that because remember, we serve an omniscient God. That means we serve a God who, who, who knows all there is to know. We serve a God who cannot learn because he has all knowledge in his head. I love saying it this way. He knew what to know before knowledge was invented for him to know. So listen to this. Abraham's obedience was not informative to God. But it was formative to Abraham. Let me say that differently. When Abraham obeyed God by raising his hand to kill Isaac, what the angel was saying to Abraham, hey, Abraham, I want you to see your growth for tra trajectory. When I first came to you and said your wife was going to have a son, you laughed and you didn't believe me. Now look at where you've come. Look at yourself. Look at the formation that has taken place in your life. You are at a place where you are unwilling to withhold anything from me, even your first begotten son. I want to point that out because when, when, when a test that results in obedience, it, de it demonstrates a high level of reverence for God. So here's this, here's this. If God is calling you, if God is calling me, if God is calling us to sacrifice something and we are wrestling with it, the honesty in our lives ought to be, we're not there yet, but we need to grow. So here's what obedience reveals. It reveals the authenticity and the genuineness of our trust in God and our love relationship with God. God says, Abraham, offer this vehicle of promise, Isaac. And here's what Abraham does. Early the next morning, he gets up and, and he got rid of all the wiggle room and he was about to do it. Then God intervened. What does it look like when God calls you? To offer a sacrifice. What does it look like for me when God calls me to offer a sacrifice? Here's the subject matter. Do we trust God like that? That we're unwilling, that we're, we're not willing to withhold anything from him? That we put it all on the table? Here's how I said it earlier. We are willing to go hard or go home? Obedience dictates our level of reverence, trust, and or dependence on God. If God says stop and you're still struggling with the thing that he says stop doing, or if he says offer this and you're still struggling with what he says to offer, that is an indicator to you of where you are on the continuum of your relationship with God. It is not new information to God. He already knows. And so here's what the test does. The test tells you how smart you are, right? Here's what this looks like. When you're in college, when you're in school, here, the teacher would instruct. Then at the end of the instruction, they would give you a test. And here's what the grade on the test does. It shows you what you've learned. It shows you what you've learned. And it's very, very important is that we not miss that in the test, right? So in reality, this statement was a revelation from God to Abraham, revealing Abraham's growth, growth position on his trajectory toward God. And where Abraham has gotten, he had gotten to a place where he was fully available and ready to be used by God because he was willing to withhold nothing from the Lord. He was all in from God. That is trust resulting in obedience. Here's the fifth and the final thing I want you to take away this morning. Trust resulting in obedience. Here's where I really want to land. It results in provision from God. Okay, so listen to this. God will provide for himself. Miles Monroe used to say it this way. When purpose begins, provision is already provided. Lord, I wish I had time to flesh this out, but I'm just going to say it this way, and I'm going to illustrate it. When purpose begins, provision 
is already provided, right? Let me say this, and then I'm going to read the text, and I'm going to say one more thing, and we're going to stop, okay? Abraham's purpose had begun because God initiated, so he was obligated to fulfill the request based on his initiation. Abraham obeyed, and God provided. God initiated, Abraham obeyed, and God provided. I'm going to say it one more time for somebody else. God initiated, Abraham obeyed, and God provided. Here's what we do. We initiate. We initiate. And then we try to obligate, to obligate God to provide what we initiate. God is not obligated to provide anything he did not initiate. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at the text. Look at verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eyes. And he looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. You see, God? So Abraham called the name of the place Jireh. The Lord will provide. And it is said to that day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. God's intent all along was for Abraham to offer a sacrifice. And the test was Abraham willing to make Isaac the sacrifice. All along, God had the provision already in place. This is a critical word going into 2021. And, and I hope you heard the series because what I'm about to say is going to be a blessing to you. When God calls you, in the words of Miles Monroe, Miles Monroe, the provision is already there, but you can't get to provision without obedience. My goodness. When God calls you, the provision is already there to do everything God wants you to do, but we cannot get to provision without obedience. This is where the trust comes into play, resulting in obedience, and we keep walking for three days if we have to. I'm speaking metaphors, right? In spite of all the questions, where's money going to come from? Where is this going to come from? If God calls you and you've trusted God and you're walking out what God says, the provision is waiting for you to get to the place of sacrifice. I love this because when Abraham got, got there, he never saw the ram, but the ram was already there. In other words, in God's sovereignty, that ram was created for that day, for that location, for that purpose, so God could offer him. Only God knew where the ram was. If you have been sitting idly waiting for provision for you to realize what God has in store for you for the year 2021, and you have not yet trusted God that resulted in obedience, you're going to be waiting for a long time for provision because provision is at the end of your obedience. My goodness, it's at the end of your obedience. I am done. Here's the call as we go into 2021. Trust God. You trust him after he speaks. You hear his voice and you follow the sound of his voice. And when you get to where he wants you, provision is there. Here's how it looks like for Jesus when he was walking the earth. I do nothing unless my father tells me. He had sense enough to realize that obedience to the voice of God result in provision. That's why he was able to heal the sick and raise the dead and to feed the 5,000. That's why he was able to do the miraculous because he knew if God sent him, God is obligated to God's own word to do what God said he is going to do. God said to Abraham and to Sarah, you're going to have a son because God spoke it. It was going to happen. God said, I'm going to make your name great, Abraham. I'm going to multiply your descendants like the sand of the sea because God spoke it. It was about to happen. You and I are not God. We listen to his voice. We trust his voice. We follow his voice. At the end of his voice, provision is there. And the result is we grow in our trust level with God just like Abraham did. My prayer for you this morning is that I've used, as you've listened to this word, <sighs> that God would bless you. We would trust God. This week we had history happen in our country. The first black woman to become a vice president. Who knows what's next, right? 
We almost had the overthrow of our democracy a couple of weeks ago, but God preserved these United States. And I still want to say to you, my trust, your trust should not be in the incoming nor the outgoing president. Our trust needs to be in the Lord. I'm going to say this. Your trust should not be on the incoming or the outgoing political regime. Your trust should be in the Lord. If you want to know where Pastor Felix is, this is what Pastor Felix is going to say. I am not concerned about who gets appointed to what office. I'm not concerned about who gets appointed to what position. I'm not concerned about any political platform. My trust is in the Lord. And as long as I hear the voice of God and I obey God, provision is at the end of my obedience. And I'm going to trust God resulting in obedience. Let's pray this morning. Father, may your word fall on pliable soil and transform some life. It is in your name we pray. Amen and amen.